I'm Professor Ann Jenilee Cook, and for the third time, I will have the pleasure of teaching Shakespeare Goes to the Movies for the Lifelong Learning Program. Uh, those of you who've been in this class before understand that um, we do three different plays. In the past, it's been a comedy, a history, and a tragedy but I've run out of plays for which there are enough productions to approach it the way I want to approach it. So this year, it'll be slightly different. We'll do Romeo and Juliet, Hamlet, and Macbeth, three of Shakespeare's best-known tragedies. I will supplement students' watching of a full-length production of that each play with clips from other sorts of productions so that you go into your viewing with a, a really broad range of what the possible options are when it comes to making dramatic choices. Um, I don't lecture when I teach Shakespeare. I prefer that, that you see Shakespeare. Uh, for too many years, I find that people in, in our generation and, and even in the coming generation are subjected to Shakespeare solely on a literary basis. And of course, whatever else a Shakespeare text is, it was a script that was intended for performance. It was a script that was intended to be shared with audiences. And that's the premise of the kind of um, interesting experiences that we're going to be having this year. Thank you. Professor of Classical Studies and Anthropology at Vanderbilt University. The course I'll be teaching uh, this winter is entitled Life and Death in Ancient Greece. And it's a course which focuses on my recent research uh, at a particular archaeological site in southern Greece. And this is a site called Kenkriai. Kenkriai in antiquity served as the eastern port of the great Greek city of Corinth. And it flourished in particular during the Roman Empire. Uh, my work at Kenkriai is very much a reflection of my own scholarly interests and my teaching interests. I'm a specialist in ancient Greece, in particular social history, archaeology, and also literature. Uh, but within that field, I'm in particular a specialist of the later phases of Greek history, that is the Roman Empire and late antiquity. Uh, this course uh, over uh, six different sessions will be a, a full overview of some of the most interesting dimension, dimensions of my research uh, at Kenkriai, at this particular archaeological site. It's an important site because it reflects in many ways uh, the diversity and the prosperity that were indicative of uh, various uh, provincial centers, various communities uh, in the eastern provinces of the Roman Empire between roughly the first and the sixth centuries of the Common Era. So the course will introduce you to how archaeology is done, how we study social diversity, socioeconomic diversity, ethnic and religious diversity in antiquity by using archaeological sources. Uh, we'll also, apart from learning a lot about interdisciplinary research about the past, about the material culture of the Mediterranean past. We'll also talk about certain important issues that, of course, classicists and archaeologists deal a lot with today. That is to say, we will spend some time exploring cultural heritage management and the ethics of archaeological research and the management of archaeological remains once they've been, of course, excavated and studied and cataloged and stored. Uh, the courses will focus on uh, several different features of our research. Each will have a theme. The first uh, course will uh, be a summary of the importance of Kenkriai, this, uh, this, this Greek port, this port in southern Greece, which flourished during the later periods of antiquity. Uh, we'll talk about, in general, the archaeological research that's happened at that site over the past 40 years and over the past decade under my own direction. Then in the other courses, we'll talk about various aspects of life at this ancient port. We'll talk about burial customs. One of my particular specialties is mortuary practices in the Greek world uh, during the Roman Empire and late antiquity. We'll also talk about other aspects of life in this ancient port town, 
Uh, we'll talk about the activities of the harbor, the commercial life of the harbor there. We'll talk about uh, the creation of texts. We'll talk about inscriptions, carvings on stone, or writings that we find in other classes of artifacts, like pots and handheld lamps. Uh, we'll talk a lot about pottery and ceramics, how we can learn about the ancient economy on the basis of ceramic evidence. And then we'll also talk about the methodology of archaeology. And as I highlighted before, we'll talk about some of the ethical challenges that professional archaeologists and professional historians face as they, uh, as they collaborate uh, with uh, foreign officials in arranging and managing archaeological projects and in how they uh, publish their evidence and they protect uh, the material evidence of the past uh, so that future scholars and future generations can learn about the past. I'm very much looking forward to teaching this course. I retired from the United Nations uh, after a 30-year career in various positions in New York and abroad and returned to Nashville, Nashville was my home, at the end of 2006 and almost immediately joined in the Osher classes. So like you, I'm also a student, but this winter semester I will have the privilege of offering a class on ethnic conflict. Now the class is not just going to be a story about ethnic groups and ethnic conflict, but also of the rise of the modern state and of nationalism, both of which are relatively recent concepts. It's also a story of how the state organizes its institutions and political processes to accommodate diversity or not. We will begin in the first session looking at theories of ethnic conflict, what it is, why it occurs, uh, how it is exacerbated, and its relationship to nationalism. In the following three classes, we will look at case studies from three areas, from the Balkans, the Caucasus, and Central Africa, and possibly South Africa, in order to see how and if the theory applies. In the fifth week, I want to talk about consocialism and other constitutional mechanisms for accommodation. And our primary examples there will be Switzerland, Belgium, and Canada. And if you don't know what consocialism is, come to the class. And finally, in the sixth week, we will attempt to look at Muslims as an ethnic minority in Europe, but particularly in the United States, and the extent to which our respective institutions and political processes actually are able to accommodate ethnic diversity, not in general, but in every specific situation. I hope that we'll be able to look both dispassionately and honestly at the question are we laying the groundwork for ethnic conflict in this country? Come to the class. I think it will be interesting. I hope it will be enjoyable. I'm sure it will be provocative. And I really do want your different points of view. See you in January. I'm Roy Gottfried, professor of English. I've been at Vanderbilt for more than three decades. I teach James Joyce, Irish literature, and modern British literature. James Joyce is certainly a complicated writer. Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake are dense, long, and recondite. By contrast, Joyce's Dubliners are concise and direct. But by studying the Dubliners, we can come to appreciate many of Joyce's artistic methods. The Dubliners involve one incident, not many. They involve sharply drawn characters, only a few. And they're very grounded in realistic details. In this course, we will read all of the Dubliners' stories. Each week, we'll discuss three stories, both as a group, as Joyce intended to write them, and as individual stories. Even though Joyce is a complicated writer, there's no one interpretation of any of his works. And so any interpretation, any idea is really fruitful for examining his art. 
Um, it's my hope that this course will encourage students to analyze and speak up and offer a variety of interpretations of these stories uh, to a particularly interesting end for everyone. Hi, I'm Carol Busey, and it is my great pleasure and honor to be teaching a new course for Vanderbilt Retirement Learning. I have taught four different courses for Vanderbilt, all related to history, and so when I was asked to teach this time, I was looking for a topic that would be interesting and new for the people who attend these Osher classes. As a result of that, I came up with the idea of offering a course on the religious history of the United States. We hear so much about religion in this country today in our news through the national media and the internet that I thought it would be an interesting exercise to go back and look at the founding of the country, look at the whole history of the United States chronologically through the perspective or the lens of religion. Who were the people that came? Clearly, diversity was a landmark, a characteristic of the people who came. They had to be tolerant because there were so many of them coming from so many different backgrounds. So for this six-week course, we're going to start with the settlers. This course, I think, is going to piggyback very nicely on the course that Professor Hambrick taught this fall semester on the religions of the world and the origins of religion. We'll start here with the Anglicans and the Puritans who came to settle the United States in those 13 colonies. Quickly, we'll get the Quakers into the equation and then talk about the revivalists who came along. Now, after getting the country established, talking a little bit about what is in the Constitution, what is not in the Constitution, and the separation of church and state, we'll talk about the Second Great Awakening, this movement which had such an impact here in Tennessee with the revivalism of the Cane uh, Ridge revivals just across the border in Kentucky and spreading all across Tennessee as well. Professor Paul Conklin, Conkin, who teaches in the Emeritus in the History Department, has a, a very interesting article about how many religious denominations in the United States got their start in Tennessee. And you see the roots of this coming from that Second Great Awakening. Uh, and you will see that continuing through after the Civil War. Now certainly we will focus on the Civil War, the causes of the Civil, Civil War, how the churches split before the country split. Some authors believe that the Civil War was inevitable once the religious denominations of the United States began to divide in the 1840s because they couldn't agree on the subject of slavery. Now, after the Civil War, we will have yet another revival movement. We will look at Dwight L. Moody moving on to the progressive era when Billy Sunday, a former professional baseball uh, player, brought revivalism to a whole new level of entertainment, gospel, and other things. We will look at the religion of the progressives. We will also be looking at religious conservatism, which here in Tennessee brought about the Scopes trial in 1925 uh, in Dayton, Tennessee. And finally, we will end up talking about religion throughout the Depression and World War II, but moving into the post-World War II era with the coming of television and new media, we'll discuss Billy Graham, uh, the movements both to the left and to the right, and the rights movement, as well as the responses of the churches and religious groups to that. The emphasis of this course is going to be religious diversity. Thank you very much.
Education Studies faculty at Vanderbilt for about 41 years. Came here as a debate coach uh, and uh, teach a variety of courses, including, uh, including on the First Amendment and on the history of rhetoric for 2,500 years. But I have, for a significant period of that time, had an interest in the area of Ireland and have taught a course on uh, the rhetoric of Irish nationalism since probably starting about 1988-1989. The course that we're dealing with here is going to be films on the Troubles. And the definition of the Irish Troubles are difficult to always come up with. Uh, when, uh, when the Easter Uprising began in 1916, somebody telephoned London. They did have telephone then and said the revolution has begun and somebody asked when did it start and the answer was 1172 when, uh, when Strongbow first invaded. But the more recent Irish troubles have focused on two periods of time. The Irish War of Independence 1918 to 1922 and the modern troubles in Northern Ireland which you can date in any particular sequence but you would normally say probably 1968 to 1998 when the Good Friday Agreement came into being. As a result, I'll do three movies on the first Troubles and three movies on the second Troubles. Uh, when I first started looking at this, there were relatively few movies uh, related to Ireland, but Ireland has had a uh, cottage industry in movies uh, over the last 20 years, and so there are a great many of them that relate to the Troubles. Most of the Irish movies, of course, are comedies uh, or, or have something, or, or dramas that have something to say about other people. But uh, the ones that we've been able to pick here uh, are, are the ones that relate uh, to uh, violence <clears throat> and warfare and that kind of excitement. Uh, they almost always have an unhappy ending, but that, of course, is an Irish story. Uh, and I hope, I hope everybody will be able to enjoy this, and as we do it, I will, uh, I, will, I will try to have some explanation of the movie at the beginning and the end and see what I can add to it. Hi, I'm Mitchell Korn, Vice President of the Nashville Symphony for Education and Community Engagement, as well as a senior lecturer at the Blair School of Music for Music and Community. And I welcome you to the class that Giancarlo Guerrero, the music director of the Nashville Symphony, and I will be teaching called How to Listen to Classical Music. Two of the classes will be taught by Maestro Guerrero, and it is a rare and wonderful opportunity to speak with Giancarlo and to hear how Giancarlo defines his role as a conductor and music director, his preparation, and what conductors actually do, comparing his style of preparing and performing different pieces of music with some of the great conductors, both historically and present. I will be following up with four classes where I'll be discussing and sharing the role of the classical and symphonic musician, how we prepare ourselves for concerts, how we were trained, how we study, and how we perform during these complex concerts where we are performing hundreds and hundreds of notes with only a week's preparation. I'll also be exploring all the instruments of the orchestra. Participants will get the opportunity to try string instruments, woodwind and brass, as well as percussion, getting them in your hands and understanding both their sound production and their unique features. Come join Giancarlo Guerrero, music director of the Nashville Symphony, and myself in how to listen to classical music. My name is James Crenshaw, and for over 40 years, I've taught a course on the Book of Job at two universities, Vanderbilt and Duke. During those 19 years at Vanderbilt and 22 years at Duke, I've published widely on the topic of the problem of evil. After retiring from Duke, two years ago and returning to Nashville, 
I've translated the book of Job for a new Bible, and I have written a comprehensive commentary on the book of Job that is scheduled for publication early next year. Quite simply, I'm intrigued by the book of Job, and I'm not alone in my response to it. Soon after the book was published, two people wrote a different version of Job, both in Greek. The first one is a testament of Job. It is presented as a last will and testament to his children. The other one, Second Esdras, is a discussion of the problems that have beset humankind. And its hero, Ezra, points an accusing finger at God and says that it would have been better if God had not created the world, since most people are going to suffer an eternity in hell. A number of commentaries followed these two works, especially commentaries by early church fathers and also by Jewish scholars, especially Saadia and Rashi and Ibn Ezra. Closer to our own time, Wolfgang von Goethe, Wolfgang von Goethe in his Faust borrowed the topic of a wager with the devil. Robert Frost on in the mask of the mask of reason talked about how the book of Job had freed God from the obligation of rewarding good deeds and punishing evil ones. The mystical poet Blake, William Blake, published 21 illuminations of the book of Job informed by Greek mythology. The poet, playwright Archibald MacLeish tried twice to modernize the book of Job, first in a book, a play called Panic, and next in JB, which was quite a hit on Broadway. Neil Simons published a work called God's Favorite, in which he pointed out that it's not very good to be a favorite of God because of all one has to suffer. A lot of artists have tried to depict the torment through which Job has passed. The psychiatrist Carl Jung wrote an answer to Job in which he said that the answer is the birth of a future divine savior who's fully divine. Now, why are all these people so intrigued with the book of Job? It is simply a philosophical debate featuring five people, five men and God. On one side is Job, on the other side is God. And Job is a pointing and accusing finger at God. It raises the issue, is it possible to serve God without thought of the reward or the punishment. It asks if there is such a thing as a just God. It is a book that is written in the most difficult Hebrew in the Bible. And it is quite simply a classic. Literary critics, both secular and religious, consider it a masterpiece and it is rarely equaled in the Bible, never equaled, and outside, rarely so. It is a classic, but classics are not born out of thin air. They have forerunners, and so does Job. Five such works have, been, have survived from the ancient Near East, three from Mesopotamia, and two from Egypt. The first is a Sumerian account of the suffering of a just or righteous person. The second 
is I will praise the Lord of wisdom and in it the gods are accused and still it provides a model for the way someone is to respond to human suffering. The Babylonian theodicy is a debate between a friend and a sufferer in which the friend accuses the sufferer of coming perilously close to blasphemy. From Egypt, there are two texts, the protests of an eloquent peasant and admonitions of Ipuwer, both of which accuse the divine shepherd of sleeping instead of governing the world with justice. <laughs> 